Brethren and guests, today I invite you to join us as we knock at the portals of Pennsylvania Grand Lodge's past and take you back 290 years to the beginning of our ancient and honorable fraternity here in Philadelphia in a presentation I call From Taverns to Temples, Homes of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania since 1731. So why, you may ask, did Masonic Lodges once meet in taverns? Taverns were natural gathering places in Great Britain where modern Freemasonry was started and in colonial America where meetings and gatherings of many types were held. During or afterward or both, food and drink was easily available. Singing and drinking toasts around the festive board were also both part of the brotherly conviviality. Many lodges used special glasses known as Masonic cannons or firing glasses when toasting. Here are some original examples from our collection here at the temple. These were designed with an exceptionally thick bottom so that at the conclusion of a toast, the members would bring them all down together on the wooden tavern tables, making a loud booming sound like a cannon. Here you can see a British list of Masonic lodges from 1733, showing one such lodge meeting at the Devil Tavern in Temple Bar, London. One member of that lodge, Daniel Cox, would go on to be the first Grand Master of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania meeting here in Philadelphia. It is for these reasons that the first stop on our tour is Tun Tavern, which was owned by brother John Hobart and considered Pennsylvania Freemasonry's first home. At least one lodge was meeting here informally in 1730. That lodge, known only as the Lodge at the Tavern, eventually became St. John's Lodge Number no. 1. Brother Benjamin Franklin became a Mason here in 1731. On St. John's Day, June 1732, a Grand Lodge meeting is known to have been held here. It was located on the east side of what was then known as King or Water Street, but now known as South Front Street. It was also referred to as Peggy Mullen's Beef Steakhouse after the wife of another proprietor, Thomas Mullen. Thomas was also the treasurer of Tun Tavern Lodge number three. There is also mention of the Grand Lodge meeting at a Sun Tavern on the very same street, but many researchers attribute this to a typographical error in one of Benjamin Franklin's Pennsylvania Gazette editions. This illustration from the Pennsylvania Historical Society alleges to show a depiction of St. John's Lodge number one holding a meeting here, but no further information is available about the sketch. Whether it shows Tun Tavern or not, it gives a good idea of what a lodge room would have looked like on one of the upper floors of a tavern at that time. The Tun Tavern site is now identified by a historic marker located on Front Street, commemorating it as the birthplace of the US Marine Corps in 1775 and memorialized in a small nearby park with a marker noting that it was also the founding location of the St. Andrews Society in 1747. The St. Andrews Society was founded to help the large number of destitute Scots arriving in Philadelphia at that time. In 1735, our early brethren moved the meeting place of the Grand Lodge up to High Street, known today as Market Street, in the heart of the city commerce. First, to the Indian King Tavern. This was also the meeting place of Franklin's Kunzo Club, which was also known as the Leather Apron Club a reference to the aprons that many workers would wear while plying their trades and not to Masonic aprons. They met Friday evenings to hold discussions about morals, philosophy, and other similar topics. In the year 1749, the location was changed once again, this time just to the east, still on Market Street, to the Royal Standard Tavern. This photo shows the neighborhood today from the perspective of the color print that you saw previously. The Indian King sat just east of Third Street or Market Street, and the Royal Standard was located at the corner of Market and Bank Streets. By 1752, the brethren, were, <clears throat> the brethren were growing tired of meeting in public houses and decided to build their own meeting place. By the late 18th century, Philadelphia had one tavern for every 25 men living in the city, so a want of more privacy and space drove this decision. As the membership numbers began to climb, space in the second floor dining room of a tavern was simply too crowded. It also presented a better image to the public. This led them to erect the first building in the Western Hemisphere solely for this purpose. 
known as Freemasons Lodge, it was dedicated on St. John's Day, 1755, by a procession from the lodge building to Christ Church, after which a banquet was held back at the hall, which was used from 1755 to 68, and again from 1778 to 1785. In the fall of 1777, as the British were threatening Philadelphia from south of the city, a number of Quaker leaders who wanted to remain out of the conflict were rounded up under suspicion of being loyalists and were imprisoned in this Masonic building. Eventually, the Continental Congress agreed with the Pennsylvania Council who had arrested them in the first place, and they were exiled to Winchester in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. This building was taken for use as a jail during at least a few of the Revolutionary War years. Financial difficulties following the American Revolution led to the building being sold in 1785. Freemasons Lodge was located in what is now the parking lot behind the U.S. Customs House, just off of 2nd Street. Grand Lodge sometimes met from 1769 to 1790 in a building about 100 feet away from Freemasons Lodge in what was then known as Vidal's Alley. It was here on September 25th, 1786, that a meeting was held, which resulted in severing our ties with the Grand Lodge of England. This building was the home of Stephen Vidal, a school teacher and member of Tun Tavern Lodge No. 3 since 1749. Grand Lodge occasionally met here until about 1790 because the house was available during the evenings. In the year 1887, a magic lantern slideshow, an ancestor of the now common PowerPoint presentation, was given here in the present Masonic Temple on the history of Freemasonry in Philadelphia. One of the slides in that show identifies this as the lodge building on the Dells Alley. Although this does not look like the building in the painting, as you probably know, after more than a century, a building can undergo so many renovations as to make it appear unrecognizable. Also, as late as 1895, Vidal's Alley and the surrounding neighborhood still existed. This neighborhood no longer exists, and this building was located approximately in the center of the present U.S. Customs House. Up until the British occupation of Philadelphia in the Revolutionary War, the Grand Lodge met at the City Tavern, which contained the second largest ballroom in the New World, so space would not have been an issue. This establishment was the gathering place for many of the famous actors who would be prominent in the founding of this country and the signers of many of our most important founding documents. It was reconstructed in the 1970s for the Bicentennial, the original having burned down in the mid 19th century. One of the things that the paintings in this presentation fail to portray is the deplorable conditions that existed in most 18th century cities. Pigs and chickens roaming about at will, horses and other livestock leaving aromatic signs of their presence and generally bad sanitation and drainage. Of course, these paintings were meant to showcase our ancient meeting places, but what, one may wonder, would it have been like to wander the dark, unilluminated streets of Philadelphia after a lodge meeting in a Philadelphia tavern or lodge hall? That question was partially answered in 1738 by brother William Hogarth, the famous 18th century British satirist and artist, and also the Grand Steward for the Grand Lodge of England in 1735. <clears throat> Although this famous illustration of his, Knight, depicts a knight in London, Philadelphia was the second largest city in the British Empire at that time, so there were probably many similarities. As you can see, there was a lot happening here. In the lower left, that little urchin blowing on a torch is a link boy. You would hire one to use like an 18th century flashlight, having him escort you through the dark streets to your destination. If you were, un uh, if you were unlucky, and got a bad one, or you were particularly drunk, you could find one of these lads leading you down a dark alley where his friends waited to rob you of your valuables and leave you in the dark. You also have here a broken carriage, a bonfire, and in the upper left corner, you can see someone emptying the contents of a chamber pot out the window and right onto the head of this guy here. This is worshipful master Thomas DeVale, a justice of the peace who was described as notorious for the severity of his punishments as he was for his immoral private life, hardly a worthy brother. He had four wives and 25 children. Hogarth did not like him, paternal considerations aside, and thus this humiliating depiction. He is being helped along by Grand Lodge Tyler Andrew Montgomery, who was described as a well-known and popular figure. Contrast that scene with this depiction of Center City, Philadelphia from a 1907 postcard in which the streets appear so clean and clear 
that even the statue of Billy Penn himself and all of City Hall appears to be dancing with joy. And if you look in the lower right hand corner, you can see the police escorting a top hat wearing gentleman from some building across from City Hall. But of course, that could be any building and any gentleman in a top hat. Jumping back to the 18th century, between 1790 and 1799, Grand Lodge rented the upper floor of the Quaker Meeting House, which can still be visited today at the corner of Arch and Fifth Streets. It can be seen here in another Magic Lantern slide photo from the 1880s, at which time it was known as Apprentice's Library, the first free library in the United States. This is also the first building used by the Grand Lodge for which we have an early indoor photograph. This image shows the second floor looking much the way it would have when it was used for, as a Masonic meeting place. Still standing to this day, it is the oldest Grand Lodge meeting place still in existence. It is now part of Independence National Historic Park. From 1800 to 1802, Governor Mifflin permitted Grand Lodge to use the office of the Secretary of the Senate in the Pennsylvania State House, which we now refer to as Independence Hall. This permission was granted because the Masons were broke, having contributed so much money to their members, widows and orphans during the yellow fever epidemic of 1793, in which Philadelphia suffered the loss of 5,000 residents. Of course, this is the iconic Independence Hall today. This arrangement was never intended to be permanent, which is just as well, for our ancient brethren were asked to move out because of a complaint filed by the great American artist, Charles Wilson Peel, who had a gallery in the building and didn't like their rowdy behavior after meetings. It makes one wonder what Mr. Peel thought of this brouhaha right outside his door during election day of 1816. Consequently, in 1802, a plain three-story building was purchased on Filbert Street between 8th and 9th Streets. This building was known as Pennsylvania Freemasons Hall. The second and third stories were used for Masonic purposes, and the first was rented out to a brother for the purpose of running a school. His teaching the children of poor brethren was the rent he paid for this purpose. This location was chosen despite the objections of some brothers that it was too far out of town. At this time, the city of Philadelphia was pretty much limited to the few blocks around what we refer to today as Old City. Once you went beyond that area, it was sparsely settled. The X on this 1802 Philadelphia map shows this lodge building's location. The squiggly lines and dots you see marking nearby city blocks are farms. The red asterisk you see off to the left indicates the farm where our present temple is located, the spot where this broadcast is coming to you from today. The public square across from it is now where Philadelphia City Hall stands. Here is a picture of Freemasons Hall in 1880, shortly before being torn down. It stood behind what was formerly Strawbridge and Clothier's department store. By 1807, it was apparent that new, bigger quarters would be needed as Freemasonry in Philadelphia continued to grow. To this end, on St. John the Baptist Day, June 24th, 1811, this magnificent new hall was dedicated with 31 lodges in attendance. Located on the north side of Chestnut Street between 7th and 8th Street, it was 101 feet 7 inches wide, 178 feet deep, and capped with a 180 foot tall wooden steeple. Freemasonry grew in the city as a result of the construction of this grand edifice. However, disaster struck. On the night of March 9, 1819, when a fire that began in a faulty fireplace flew, completely destroyed the temple and most of its contents. The first floor had been rented out that evening for a dance and a lodge meeting was being held on the second floor. Within two days, our brethren voted to rebuild and meanwhile returned to their old building on Filbert Street while construction carried on. The rebuilt hall was dedicated November 1st, 1820, this time without the steeple, but with illumination provided by an apparatus that burned carbureted hydrogen gas made from tar, making it the first gas illuminated building in Philadelphia. It was built with an informal arrangement with a dancing academy that it could be used as a ball and concert venue. To accommodate that purpose, the floor of the first floor public room was laid upon an arrangement of springs. This was known as a sprung floor. Because of this, on one occasion, the room was so packed with people that the floor suddenly compressed, causing considerable panic. It was here that General Lafayette was honored on his visit to Philadelphia in 1824. Other non-Masonic uses were political meetings 
exhibitions of the Academy of the Fine Arts and the Franklin Institute, which sometimes required covering over the entire front yard of the building. This was also the location of the very first Philadelphia Flower Show in 1829, a fact that was recently commemorated with a new historical marker at the temple's former location. We will be returning to speak about this building again in just a few moments. Because of the disastrous effects of the anti-Masonic movement in the late 1820s and early 1830s, Grand Lodge decided to sell the Chestnut Street building to the Franklin Institute and purchase Washington Hall, located on Third Street above Spruce. This had been the property of the Washington Benevolent Association, which presented us with Brother Washington's apron, which is still on display here in the museum. After the Grand Lodge left this location, the hall burned to the ground and a local Masonic brother erected a furniture and cabinet store on the site. It was here in that furniture and cabinet store that most of the woodwork in the temple we are in today was constructed. Here are some examples of this woodwork in our current temple at Broad and Filbert Streets. Today, the Washington Hall site contains only modern buildings. By 1841, the Franklin Institute defaulted on the mortgage for the old temple on Chestnut Street, seen here in a photograph taken in the early 1850s before it was torn down. Because of this, possession of the building reverted back to the Grand Lodge, which then rented it out for a variety of purposes, one of which was public entertainment. Freemason Charles Stratton, better known to the world as General Tom Thumb, and who gained worldwide fame working with well-known Freemason P.T. Barnum, performed here at least once in 1848, as did the famous showman, Ang and Chang Bunker, better known to the world as the Siamese Twins. This 1844 newspaper ad promotes the Fakir of Abba, an English magician named Hughes, who traveled far and wide wearing dark makeup and pretending he was from Burma. He would put on a variety of shows, as you can see here. And here, I'll give you just a few seconds if you wanna look over this um, list of performances that were taking place at the Masonic Hall on uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And also in the same newspaper, there was an ad for the sale of this property. If you look at the address in this ad, you will see it says the temple was located between Delaware 7th and 8th Streets, which sounds confusing. Back at this time, the city of Philadelphia numbered streets from the Delaware River going west, as they do now, and from the Schuylkill River going east, which as the city grew became very confusing and they went with the system that we now have to this day. In 1852, the Brethren decided to move back to the Chestnut Street location, as apparently no one was interested in purchasing it. Because some of the acts and performances were booked so indiscriminately, it gained the reputation as a place no decent person would want to be seen. For this reason, it was decided to tear it down and build an even bigger temple, as Freemasonry had grown so much in the years since they left the building. More meeting space was needed. Several of the windows from this structure were also reused in the construction of the Masonic Temple in Bristol, Pennsylvania, as seen in this modern day photo on the right. And I'll give you just a couple of seconds if you'd like to take a comparison of the 1850 photo and the contemporary photo, you can see the, uh, those windows still exist up, out in Bucks County. As construction began on this new temple, the original cornerstone from 1809 was discovered as this article reports from the American Freemason magazine. Apparently the builders were looking for it in the southeast corner and not the northeast corner where cornerstones are traditionally placed. And you can see the writer got in a little dig at our expense, mocking us with pretty masons they were. The cornerstone laying ceremony for this new temple was conducted in the pouring rain on November 21st, 1853, as seen in this sketch made from an original daguerreotype photograph. This new hall was dedicated in 1855 at a ceremony attended by over 4,000 masons. It was constructed in the newly popular and wildly ornamental Gothic style and was considered at the time the most magnificent hall of its kind in the United States. It stood on the site of the previous hall. This photo taken around 1859 shows the Grand Lodge building within the context of its neighborhood, wall-to-wall -wall retail shops. In fact, the temple itself displays the typical mid 19th century shop awnings under which merchants would display their wares. This is because the ground floor was rented out as retail space. This is the first temple for which there exists a painting showing the lodge room. As you can see, the Gothic theme is carried to magnificent extremes here as well. And I'll just give you a few seconds to take a look at some of the details of this magnificently ornate room. 
This is also the first temple for which we have a period photo of the inside, showing the master's chair in the east and some of the carved wooden statuary. This is the same chair that currently resides in Gothic Hall here in this building. It is made of hand carved oak and was created in 1855 by Joseph Bailey and Charles Bushler, the same sculptors who carved the figures strength, wisdom, beauty, hope, and faith, which appear in the painting and photograph and now reside on the second floor of our present building. Despite its magnificent looks, the building on Chestnut Street was costly and difficult to care for. The basement flooded frequently and the rooms proved too small. And I would like at this point to call your attention to the building that sits just to the left of the temple, uh, the four-story building that has an awning in front of it where you can read the word carpeting. And I'm gonna point that out again in a few, uh, in a few minutes. After moving to our, into our current building in 1873, it was sold and used as a theater, the Temple Theater. The new owners also painted the brownstone exterior white, which upset a lot of Masons, even though it wasn't theirs anymore. This photo gives a much better image of the exterior Gothic design. I need to take a few seconds to take a look at some of that beautiful Gothic design. And again, I will call your attention to that building that sits just to the left of the temple. Unfortunately, this magnificent building burned down in 1886. The night it caught fire, December 27th, the traditional gathering and ceremonies were taking place in our current building for St. John's Day. When news of the fire reached here during the banquet, there were a number of Masons who ran over to witness the final minutes of their once grand temple. The Union Trust Company, seen here on the left, was built on that spot. Today, only the left side of that building can be seen on Chestnut Street. And if you take a look at the modern photo to your right, you can see the building I've been pointing out in the last couple of 19th century photos. The first floor has now been completely modernized and is where Morimoto's restaurant is located. But if you look from the second, third, and fourth floors, you can see that it pretty much hasn't changed since the mid 19th century. By 1868, our present property, which you can see here before being cleared, was already purchased at the corner of Filbert and Broad Street, and construction could begin. On St. John the Baptist Day, June 24, 1868, an estimated 10,000 Masons gathered to take part in the cornerstone laying ceremonies. <clears throat> Those conducting the actual ceremony can be seen here in the northeastern part of our property. If you look in the left foreground, you will see two objects that look like pictures. These are two of the three vessels which are used in a Masonic cornerstone ceremony to hold corn, wine, and oil. Here they are, along with a small bottle of corn, which was gathered up and saved by someone after the ceremony. These are still used to this day and are on display in our exhibit hall here at the temple. This photo shows the actual ceremony in progress with one of the participants pouring the contents of one of the containers onto the cornerstone. You can see his right hand pouring if you look directly underneath the pulley wheel in the upper portion of the photograph. Shortly after this, construction could begin. Except for interior decoration, the building was completed in 1873. On the morning of September 26, 1873, more than 13,000 Masons gathered in Philadelphia and marched south on Broad Street to the New Temple for dedication ceremonies. The Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania had finally found a suitable home in what has become a familiar landmark on the downtown Philadelphia streetscape. After 142 years of moving about, like the giant playing pieces on the oversized novelty game board over which it looms, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania has come to rest at the heart of the city that gave it birth. Well, thank you everybody very much. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Thank you very much for joining us and have a nice day.